we're we're changing things. Oh yeah, I was just wondering if you know because you sound like you're We're changing. Am I interrupting? <laughs> we're changing things a little bit. Uh, we've done two things so far, basically two big categories of things. We started with kinematics of particles. That's how we started the course a long time ago. Remember what kinematics is? Constant acceleration. Yeah, just, just the, not constant acceleration. That's one small part of it. But it's just the, the business of where something is, what it's doing while it's there, what it's going to do next, that type of thing. And then, and then all of those things were tied together with time. So that's all we looked at the first uh, first couple weeks of the term. Then we went to the kinetics of particles. Remember what that was? That was three things. And in fact, the third we got, I believe, just Monday. Maybe a week ago, I forget exactly when we got it. But that was the third of the pieces of kinetics of particles that we did. Forces. Huh? Forces. Kinetics is, is how do we get these things? How do we get something to accelerate? Or how do we get it to not accelerate, depending on which it is we need? But it was... Uh, the involvement of the forces, how the forces are what affect the acceleration. Once you set the acceleration, then the velocity and the position uh, can all fall from that. And we looked at three different ways to solve kinetics of particle problems. What was the second? Yeah, the work energy equation. It wasn't something that works uh, it's not that these two don't work together. It was just another way to look at everything. Um, but it, uh, pieces of it came directly from F equals MA. So these aren't exclusive. It was just a, a little bit uh, better way to look at some things. And then the last one we just got. Impulse momentum. Impulse momentum. And each one of them solved a particular type of problem in a little bit better way, but they all came from F, the, the two and three came from F equals MA, anyway, so it's not like they're exclusive, it's just a, it was, it was sort of a prepackaged form of F equals MA that allowed us to solve different types of problems that, that might have been a little bit more difficult if we just approached them in the F equals MA way. Um, but remember what type of problems this was real good for? Yeah, constant force problems, which we did a lot of. Constant force and constant acceleration, assuming the mass is constant. Work energy worked well for position-dependent problems because the work is very much dependent upon how much distance has gone by and how much distance has gone by depends upon where the object was. Um, and then certainly the uh, uh, potential gravitational potential energy term and the elastic potential energy term very much had to do with position. Almost exclusively uh, those were based upon position but just some other little parts of it put in, like the strength of the spring and the strength of the gravitational field. And then impulse momentum, haven't had too much chance to test drive it probably. There's a, a couple of problems there with it though, but we, we've been working with it in class a lot. Uh, just didn't get it in its impulse momentum form until Monday. Works well for what type of problems? Time dependent problems. Because uh, the, the uh, impulse is the integration of the force time curve. So forces change with time, uh, then 
it uh, is, is it's, it's uh, almost a no-brainer to calculate the impulse. You just integrate the curve, and you guys are, are uh, real good at integrating. So now we're going to put that behind us, sort of, except that we're going to start over. Start over from the very first day. So, well, I'm going to skip introducing myself. You know who I am. Now, no, we're 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 going to kind of start over. We're not going to start. We're going to do all this stuff again, but not with particles. Now we're going to do all this stuff again, and we'll start with the kinematics. We're going to start with the kinematics now of rigid bodies. No, I don't mean your date last Saturday night. That's not what I mean. That's what you're all thinking. Let's see, Amanda slash Samantha wasn't here, so talk like oh damn, talk like oh. I need to like like I need I need to edit the tape. That's what I need to do. <laughs> Actually, I need to edit myself, but I've proven over the years that it's. Can't do that. It's harder to do in real time. That, that is. That's that's proof. So we're gonna look at the kinematics of rigid bodies. Never before did it matter to us how something was oriented, where it was facing, how it was turned. Uh, remember the kinematics of particles. We even talked about the fact that that if we're talking about position and velocity and acceleration and if we were even doing it of a person or a car I didn't care which way the car or the person was facing I just said it's here then later it's here what it do in between to get there that's all we ever looked at we we took a single point to represent what could be a very complicated object in some very complicated motion we used just a single point uh, in the last couple weeks, we kind of came to understand, without ever having said so before, that uh, the center of mass would do very well as that point. But I never even bothered with that in the first couple weeks of the class. If I was talking about the space station orbiting the Earth, we just took the space station to be a single little point, and that little point represented the space station and it was that point that we got to orbit the Earth and we looked at how it would do so and what the forces are, all those types of things we looked at. That's not going to be the case anymore. Now we're going to worry about how things are facing and how do we get them to face some other way. If I need to move a car from one place to another, it's not just as simple as getting one little point on that car to go somewhere else. I've got tires to turn and wheels to turn and I've got pistons to turn, all kinds of things that are in very different orientations each split second of time that goes by in the travel of that single car that we took as a single point in space for all the weeks coming up to here. So now we're going to take our first step into how do we get these things to change their orientation, not just change their position. So first, a real quick, real simple definition of a rigid body. Well, obviously, it's any object whose shape does not change. But we're going to be a little bit more uh, formal with it uh, in our understanding. Any object could be a, a potato. Oh, I hate I uh, hate to make you guys hungry. I know you like potatoes. <laughs> you're, you're, yeah, tater tots. You're all a little butter and sour cream. Probably. <laughs> probably. Oh, yeah. Anyway, uh, moving, moving onward. Uh, a rigid body is anything that we could describe with three points that aren't in a straight line with each other. Any three points. So by saying any three points, I mean that we're essentially, at least in our minds, checking the entire object everywhere because those points could be anywhere as long as they're not all in the straight line. Three points not in the straight line make a triangle and a rigid body 
is an object that can go through any type of motion. I don't care if it accelerates or it skids with friction or it rotates or it rotates and accelerates and tumbles and rolls and all the possible type of things real objects can do. No matter what it does, that triangle will never change. Not in its angles, not in its sides. It'll always be exactly that same triangle. And if you think about it, well, that's exactly what you'd expect of a rigid body. It's not going to change any size or shape in any way. And what better way, more simple way to, to describe a shape than a triangle. So uh, any triangle we could associate with that object, no matter what we do to it, no matter what forces we push on it, no matter what, uh, what impulse or work we do on it, that triangle itself, even if it's not a real one, just a virtual one, will never change shape. Does that sound like a fair definition of a rigid body that is about as simple as we could do and, and we're done with it? Alan, you okay? You look like you're frowning, like you, you don't believe that's rigid enough. Yeah? That's a rigid definition of a rigid body? Beautiful. Beautiful. Triangular tater. <laughs> oh, triangular tater tots. The old triangle potato. Yeah, all right, so here we go. So here we go. Good time. All right, so let's, uh, let's see. Uh, kinematics of rigid bodies. Let's, um, well, let's start kind of like we did before. What we started with, with kinematics of particles, we started with position. And then we looked at what happens as position changes. And then we looked at what happens when the change in position changes and so on. We built up from there. So, uh, so here's, here's some rigid body. We'll just keep it nice and simple. We'll make it circular. Um, you're all as good at drawing circles as I am. Go, Alan. Do I have to call Professor Hamster out here and scold you? The terrible thing is that's not too bad a circle. But, but on the screen up here, it gets distorted because the camera's up there shooting down. And it, it, it's, it's really pitiful. I have to actually, if I want it to look good on camera, I have to draw it such a way that it doesn't look good for you. But you're the paying customer, so you get my best circle. All right, so there's a circle. And position, um, all we're going to worry about for position right now is orientation. We're not going to let its, its general bulk uh, linear position change. In other words, this object is right here and for the most part it's going to stay right here. But its orientation is going to change only. Well, the, the simplest way that kind of thing happens is if we pin it at one point and let it turn about that point. Then its orientation, orientation is changing but its linear position isn't. So it's not going to be quite like a car tire because those rotate and they translate. We're just going to—it's going to be much more like a like a, a clock or a gear in a big machine that can turn, but that's all it does. And it can turn left and it can turn right and it can speed up and it can slow down and all the other things our particles did. We're going to let our rigid body do now. So we'll pin it at one point. As convenient as any is that center point for the picture word, kind of pictures we're doing. But this, this again could be a potato or a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or anything else that we could pin and then let turn. So position, well, uh, what, are, what was the first thing we needed when we were talking about determining the position of a particle weeks ago? Not just an origin, but an arbitrary origin. We can pick it anywhere, as long as we all understand what it is, it's good enough to keep going. So, uh, as useful as anything for our origin is a line uh, that we'll use for reference. So, why not a horizontal line like that? And then we let it undergo some kind of simple rigid body motion that does not include linear motion, does not include translation. We'll just let it undergo some simple rotation about that one point where we pinned it. 
So position then is going to be a very, uh, some kind of variance from that reference point. Uh, the thing's just going to turn through a bit of an angle. So that will be our position. So this is this is our reference position, our origin. Um, we'll use the letter theta to represent angle. So um, for any purpose that we're talking about, we might, if we need an origin, we'll call that origin theta equals zero. And then we'll turn through some angle. So that might be theta one, this might be theta two equals something else. And you've all used protractors before. You could throw one down there and measure that. Maybe it's about 40 degrees, something like that. We can see what that is. And so, so now we've already got then change in position. And, and so uh, we're, we're already catching up with the places where we've been talking about the kinematics of particles, only now kinematics are really bodies. The only thing, though, that's not going to work for us here that we've got to change, and it's, it's, uh, it's not too great a change. It's kind of like changing in your mind from talking about uh, our position in inches and feet, which we're all very used to, to talking about position in centimeters and meters, which is we're not as used to, but we're okay with. We, we can handle. Just have to get. We have to do the same thing with angle. Degrees is not going to work for us because we've got a, a lot of calculations coming up, just like we did here. We've got a lot of things to figure out and calculate, and degrees don't work in those equations. We need something that does. So we're going to measure our angles in radians. We can talk about them in degrees, but our angle measurement will be what's called a radian. In an entire circumference, once all the way around, well, here, here's probably the easiest way to talk about it, I guess. Imagine a circle just like you did when you were first taking uh, trigonometry, everything there was built upon the unit circle, wasn't it? A circle of radius one. And they didn't say one foot, they didn't say one meter, they just said a unit circle. We're gonna look at a circle with radius one. So that's what we'll do here. Uh, because this, this really is uh, directly a part of the, the trigonometry anyway. So a radius of circle one has a circumference of two pi, not two pi r because r equals one, so very simply two pi. So we're gonna let some amount of the distance around that circumference represent our angle. And it's just what you did in trigonometry. For example, 90 degrees as we might refer to it in easy discussion is one quarter of the way around the circle. So that's one quarter of two pi or what, pi over two. Remember talking in trigonometry about angles, especially the, the, uh, the regular, nice regular angles of 45, 90, 180, uh, 270, three, we just talked about it. That's, that's all a radian, that's all the uh, radians are. It's that trigonometry angle measurement that you used uh, when you first picked up trigonometry. You guys probably started it a couple years ago is when you first hit it. So that's, that's the very same thing we're going to use. We can talk in terms of degrees because I don't know about you, after all these years of doing this kind of stuff, I don't think in radians. You tell me the angle's three pi over four, you're gonna have to give me about 15 minutes to work out what that means in my head. On a good day, 12 minutes. 
but you tell me uh, 118 degrees, I got that, I know what that means. So, so we'll talk in degrees, but we've got to do our calculating in radians. So that's going to be our base unit for these, these for, the, for the position of a rigid body in rotational motion of some kind. And uh, we'll abbreviate it RAD, because we're just too dang lazy to, to write out the entire word. So RAD will suffice. All right, so we've already got uh, change, we've already got position, we've already got change in position set, just like we did with particle, uh, particle motion a long time ago. But then, of course, the question comes up, we're not just interested in the change in position, but we're interested in how quickly that change in position occurs. So we're going to take a look at uh, what the change in position is per unit time. How many radians per second is that position changing? Yeah, it went from, from this orientation to this orientation, or it could even be an object that went from here to here. We could, we could look at it in that same way, I guess. That's no real difference, because uh, the point on the edge of that thing did exactly that. Um, so we're interested in, in what was its rate of change of position in radians per second. So, let's see. Let's, see, let's, let's even make ourselves a, a little chart. We, we started with linear <coughs> motion. We started with position. Then we had uh, change in position. Then we had change in position with time. Remember what I called that? That's velocity. That, uh, even, even more generally though, or maybe more specifically, that's what kind of velocity? As I've got written here. Vector. Uh, yeah, vector. Has to do with the fact that we're only looking at a bulk change in position, not the change in position in any of the things in between. So what? Average. This was average velocity. And then we went to instantaneous velocity. So this looks like, well, if theta is an angle, which it is, whether measured in radians or degrees, it's an angle, this must be angular velocity. And it is. This is angular velocity. So it, it needs a nice symbol, it's average angular velocity. We use the symbol omega, kind of a fat round W, omega. And it's, it's available uh, in, in uh, if you go on Word, you go to insert and then symbols, it, you can find it on there uh, as one of the, uh, the original Greek letters, the type of thing we like to use now. So we have this definition of angular velocity, the rate at which the angular position is changing on average. And shouldn't be too much of a stretch for you to figure, well, if I've got average angular velocity, I'll bet you we've got instantaneous average, sorry, instantaneous angular velocity, which is the average velocity as the time step goes down to to an instant in time. And we've got that as well. So we've got this, this linear business and we've got this rotational business that's going along hand in hand. For position, we have now angle. We then had change in position. We then had average angular speed uh, and we've got instantaneous d omega dt there's, there's we're not really even learning anything new 
it's all the same thing. It's just instead of position along the number line type idea, it's position as an angle. But nothing's really changing. Everything looks, everything looks very, very similar. We do need one other thing, though, right now. It's a good time to bring it in. How do we know, if, if, uh, if we have all this written now, how do we know this object is turning counterclockwise or clockwise? Does that make any difference in a problem? Yeah, I don't think you'd want to get in your car and have some of the wheels going one way and some of the wheels going the other way. Yeah, will bet it matters which way things turn. So we need some way to designate for us the direction things are turning. Uh, because in fact, this is just like this was. This is a vector quantity. It's got magnitude. A 40 degree angle is very different than a 50 degree angle. It's also got direction. 40 degrees that way is very different than 40 degrees that way. So these are vector quantities just like the position ones were. So, so we really are duplicating what we did here. Now we'll have to think about that a little bit more, how we're going to actually designate that, how we're going to write that, but that's the, that's the deal. These are all really vector quantities. But it's going to be pretty straightforward for us. Because in this class, every rigid body we're talking about is going to lay in a single plane during all its motion. These things aren't going to turn and wobble like they could do. You know, if I took a Frisbee, put it on the table, and gave it that kind of funny spin they do, and then they wobble as they rotate, well, it's not, it's not going through any linear motion because it's still right there. But it's going through a very complex type of motion when it does that. We're, we're going to make ours even simpler than that in that whatever we have that's turning is going to stay in a single plane. Whether it's a vertical plane like that circle, if I could actually have something up there spinning, or whether it was be on the table and it would just turn in one place. Uh, it, it's, it's really a 2D motion. In fact, it's kind of like the circular motion. If you look at just a point on the edge of this, it's just going in circular motion type of thing that we've looked at before. Except now it's a whole object doing that. So there's two ways we can handle, three ways we can handle this direction business that we've got to handle. One, we could say, let's do what we did here and say one direction is positive and the other direction is negative. So we could say, uh, well, let's call that direction positive the other direction negative. That would work. That would work just fine. Nothing up here would have to change. That would work just great. We could say any kind of angular change in the opposite direction we could call negative. That would work and that would work in the equations too. Which is good. That's nice when things work in the equations without messing up. Uh, it means you got to keep an eye on your negative signs, but it works. It works just fine. We could also say, well, for direction, I'll just say counterclockwise or clockwise. That would work too, but it wouldn't work in the equations. Because how do equations work with CW in them for clockwise and CCW for counterclockwise? So it, it would work for our understanding and our verbal discussion of things and for our uh, way for us to post results to a problem, but it wouldn't quite work in the equations. Not as nicely, but it would work. So we could do something simple like clockwise and, oops, I was using my, my Russian watch. They always run backwards. Counterclockwise and clockwise. We could do that. Oh, you guys all have digital watches. Do you know what counterclockwise and clockwise even means? That's a clock. Don't tell me you haven't looked at it once all, all year. You look about 12 times a period. Um, 
God, that, that didn't stop. No, no, it is still going. Jeez, I thought it would stop. So, we could do that for discussion, just wouldn't work in the equations. So, mostly what we'll do is with the minus signs. But there's another way we could do it. And it would work for the general type of circulation where something could be wobbling and rotating. Because that's a full three-dimensional type motion. More than just our two-dimensional motion. Minus, plus and minus wouldn't work there in, in full three-dimensional motion because, uh, well, I don't know, what does a minus and a plus mean when th something's going all over the place? But there is another way for us to describe this that works for what we're doing here, works in the equations, and would work in full 3D motion if we bothered to get to it. And that's where we talk about the possibility this could be a full 3D vector. Here's how we do it. For a example, for a counterclockwise motion, take your right hand, you can borrow mine, Take my right, take your right hand, put your fingers in the direction of the motion. That automatically puts your thumb in a direction right out of the board. So we can call, we can say that a rotational vector in the counterclockwise way will represent with a vector that comes out of the board in the K direction. So we could say, um, for example, we could say for this angle here, we could say that's plus, let, let's call it 40 degrees. We could say it's 40 degrees counterclockwise, or we could say it's 40 degrees, or we'd use the radian equivalent, but remember I said we could use degrees if we're just discussing stuff. We could say 40 degrees, and we'll call that the plus K direction. Or we, we use, you know, pi over 4 or whatever 40 degrees is in the K direction. That's got magnitude, it's got units, whether we're radians or degrees, you'd still know exactly what I was talking about. That's called the right hand rule because it's all different if you use left hand. If you put your left hand up there in the curl, you get your thumb in the opposite direction, now we don't agree with what we're talking about. So we say we agree on a right hand rule, fingers in the direction of the motion of concern, that thumb comes straight out of the board, that gives us a, a direction. So a, 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 a angular velocity vector that's in one direction into or out of the board, and longer or shorter gives us all the things we need that, uh, that perfectly and usefully describes this angular position, angular velocity type stuff we're thinking of. So that would also work in these equations. But so will the plus and minus. And we'll see some stuff. We'll, we'll do a couple problems uh, in a second here and work it out. All right. Any troubles so far? It's not really, there's not really been anything new yet, except uh, we have to look at position a little bit differently than we did before, but, but the basics are still very, very similar. Joey? Which, which direction is positive, the counterclockwise or? Uh, well, we can agree on, on whichever one, just like we could do that with this. Remember, a lot of times we had to talk is plus up or is plus down. We can do the same thing here. Typically, though, counterclockwise is taken as positive. And that also goes with this K vector business because typically that's our coordinate system. We use a right-handed coordinate system in general which means x rolled into y gives you z. And that would be out of the board, that would be positive, so that all agrees. That's the, that's the definition of a right-handed coordinate system. x crossed into y gives you z, that's a right-handed system.
so we, we can call that positive because that would give us a positive k vector. But typically, that's what you did in trig class anyway, wasn't it? That was a positive direction, and the other way was a negative direction. In fact, I think Alan and I had an argument about that a couple of months ago. Didn't we, Alan? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I was right. And you were, <laughs> it was right. Let's pretend you were. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, uh, all that's really changed, none of the concepts have changed terribly. Uh, just the symbols have and our definition definition of physician but then after that everything just uh, it's just we just swapped out the symbols and we got exactly the same stuff so let's see uh, there's the possibility then of course just like there was with the particle motion that the velocity could change we might be interested in velocity changes in fact, not just velocity changes, but the rate in which velocity changes. So we've got something spinning, so its position is changing. We've got something spinning such that it's got some angular velocity, and maybe that angular velocity is changing, and we're interested in that very type of thing. If you're working for a company that's producing uh, uh, CD readers for computers, a big concern to you is the speed with which that CD is turning. What should we call this? This was angular velocity. We should call this then probably angular acceleration. In fact, would you, you had something else in there. Average. Average angular acceleration. So we can't use an A because then we wouldn't understand which kind of motion we're talking about. So we've got to use a different symbol than A to show us its angular acceleration. So keeping with our theme of using Greek letters in here, we'll use an alpha. It's pretty good for, for angle, for, for acceleration. And it too is a vector. The speed can be changing in one direction or the other. It could be speeding up clockwise, could be slowing down clockwise. And of course, we've got instantaneous acceleration as well. which is the time differential. So, so we've got uh, all these things that we've done before. We just have really not much more than a symbol change. Take out V, put in omega. Nothing's different. Take out A, put in alpha. So take out S or X or Y and put in theta. Got exactly the same, same, same thing here. We're gonna make a big long chart. So we've got a chart of each, but if you got these and you know what the new symbols are, you've got the new equation. That's going to be easy. We don't even have to learn anything new. We like learning where we're not learning anything new because it's so easy to do. something a little bit different when we talk about acceleration. That's, that's really important. We've got something here that can rotate and uh, let's, uh, let's look at a point right on the outside. Now maybe that's 
that's where maybe this is a gear that's rotating and you've got some kind of linkage that needs to attach there and you need to know the forces in that linkage because you don't want that thing to break loose when this machine is running whatever it might be we've got some point right there that's of concern let's give this uh, this wheel some angular velocity and I, I'll just pick it in one direction or the other so I'll pick it in that direction um, we can say counterclockwise we can say positive we can say omega in the k direction remember those all equal the same thing so that point at that instant has that velocity. No different than when we looked at circular motion a couple weeks ago. Um, does it seem pretty obvious that the farther this point is, whatever it is, and I don't care what it is, it's just some point of interest for some reason, the farther that point is away from the center of rotation, the bigger this velocity is going to be. Because if this object turns once around, an object going in this circle, a point going in that circle, has got to go a lot farther than a point going in this little circle in the same amount of time. So it's got to be going faster. It has farther to go, but it's got to do it in the same amount of time. If they didn't go once around together, in the same amount of time, it wouldn't be a rigid body, would it? So, uh, this velocity must have something to do with not just the rotational speed of the object, but the distance from the center. And those things are related. Very simply as well, velocity equals r omega. It's that simple. In fact, you could have come up with this yourself with a little bit of uh, a little bit of thinking here. Let's see. Um, let's say our original direction, our reference direction, is there. So um, the object went from the point of interest went from here to here through some angle theta. Do you remember from trigonometry how to calculate that distance, that arc length? Let me, let me change where I'm putting my letters some so we can really talk about the arc length. So this is a radius r, that's angle theta, and this is some distance that that point traveled, s. Do you remember how to calculate arc length from angle? Remember from uh, from uh, trig doing that, huh? I don't know that word. Good thing you mumbled it so I didn't hear it. Okay. Keep it just between you and me. <laughs> arc length. If you remember, arc length was s equals r theta. If theta is in radians, did you do that in trig? Maybe it kind of, kind, of, kind of just sort of came out of the mist all of a sudden. The, the mist of your young memories, which is a lot thinner mist than the mist of my memory in my advancing age. So, everybody's relatively comfortable with having seen that before. Maybe you couldn't have pulled it right out, but there it is. And you oh yeah, now I got it. I now remember seeing something like that. What if we took the time derivative of this? The rate at which the arc length is changing as this thing moves along. ds dt. Well, r is a constant, is it not? Yeah, it's a rigid body. You bet it's a constant. So it comes out of the derivative. We've got then d theta dt. What's another name for ds dt? 
velocity. What's another name for d theta dt? Angular velocity. So you could have come up with this if you'd only remember the arc length. And then I told you to determine the rate of speed of something going around that arc length. So what about now? This is where things get a little bit trickier. An object going in a circle like that is only ever moving tangential to the circle. Is that right? The velocity vector is always tangential to the circle at any instant. Because if it wasn't, the only other place it could go in an orthogonal coordinate system is either comes closer to the center or farther away from the center and then it wouldn't be a rigid body again. That radius cannot change on a rigid body. So this velocity, maybe I'll even put a little T on it to remind us that it's always a tangential velocity. There's no radial velocity, no velocity in the radial direction. It's not coming in closer to the center. It's not going out farther away from the center. It just can't do it. So let me ask you this. Um, is that point, let's, let's say omega is constant. Something spinning at a good regular speed. Uh, some of you have seen record players. Maybe your folks have one still. Maybe you even have your own. You seem like an audio audiophile a little bit. Record players. Uh, you turn them on, take a little bit, just a moment or two to come up to speed, but then they have to run at the very same speed or the record doesn't play right. It's not really true with CDs. Uh, music CDs might do that, but data CDs are always changing speed all over the place as the, as the memory goes from the reader thing, head goes from point to point to read your files and like. But a record player's got to come up to a good constant speed and run at that speed. So let's say that W equals constant for here, for, for time being. So we've got this thing. What then is the velocity, constant or not? Yeah, at least constant magnitude has got to be. So what's the acceleration of this point? Oh. The acceleration of an object going in a circle, isn't that point going in a circle? Yeah, what's the directions. acceleration of that point? Direction's changing. Direction's always changing. What's the acceleration? The centripetal acceleration. So uh, we've got this centripetal acceleration, which is v squared, v squared over r. Uh, where remember this is the tangential velocity because that's the only one it's got. So that's the magnitude of v. Uh, but v is r omega because we want to link all this to the rotational speed so this is r squared omega squared over r or r cancel r omega squared so now we can link the centripetal acceleration of this point to the angular speed. Um, acceleration is a vector. So what's the direction of this vector? Yeah, that's what the centripetal means. It's always towards the center. So I'll add that little directional component to it. Always toward center. So there we've got 
we can figure out the magnitude. We can figure out the acceleration of that point, the centripetal acceleration. What about this? What about the fact that omega could be changing? The centripetal dis acceleration only depends upon omega. But omega could be changing. Well, it means this would be changing. But where's alpha in this? The fact that we could have an angular acceleration. Either this point could be going around faster and faster and faster and faster, or it could be going around slower and slower and slower. We don't have that in there yet. The fact that, well, if alpha changes, what happens to this? It changes too. We didn't look at that last, uh, the, the early part of the term when we were looking at cir circular motion, but it's certainly possible. There's also the possibility of a tangential acceleration. That point could be going around the circular path faster and faster and faster and faster as if you're in a car going around the circular track. Radius never changes, but the needle's going up. That's an acceleration that would be in the direction of this velocity. It would be a tangential acceleration. That's, remember, that's all your speedometer ever records is your tangential velocity and your tangential acceleration. How do we get that in there? We take the time derivative of this equation. Because that's a tangential velocity. This is the tangential acceleration. So it's going to be dv dt. r is constant comes out, we have d omega dt. What's another name for omega, uh, d omega dt? Alpha. So this is r alpha. So we have the possibility of handling angular acceleration which causes this point to have acceleration in two different directions. It's always accelerating towards the center. That's the deal with circular paths. But it could be speeding up or slowing down around that circular path as well. Yeah. How's your head feel now? Okay. There's that possibility. What did we do with acceleration when we looked at particle motion? What did we then do with acceleration problems? We said, well, let's stick with constant acceleration problems. Didn't we? I did. Did you? Yeah, you got that tattoo. Right? You went and got the constant acceleration equation tattoo. Didn't you, Bill? Right my right. I'm good. That's where, yep. On the inside of your eyelids. There it is. Right after, right after her phone number. Don't tell my wife I still have that phone number. I'll deny Oh, I can't deny it. <laughs> Plus, Samantha, she'll, she probably watches this and then texts my wife what I said that day just to get me in trouble. Alright, so let's see. We had those constant acceleration equations. We're going to do constant acceleration problems here as well. So let's see. Uh, anybody have that sheet handy just so we can do them in the same number? What are you looking for? Check your tattoo. 
you, you're busted, weren't they? You just looked at your tattoo, said, "Yeah, I got what? What do you need?" No, man. All these guys are pulling out some sheet of paper or something. Bill, you only need the blank. What are you doing? <laughs> God, what a bunch of liars and phonies. All right, let's see. First one. Uh, remember, the order didn't matter, but uh, the order in which they appeared in the book. The first one was the average velocity which is delta S over delta T. Well, the, t the average of two numbers is you add them together and divide by two. So there was the first constant acceleration equation. Right, look familiar? The first one on your tattoo? Yep, there it is. Thank you. Thank you for following my simple directions. All right, let's see. Uh, wherever there's an S, put a theta. Wherever there's a V, put an omega. Wherever there's a T, leave it alone. So omega average equals delta theta over delta T equals omega 2 plus omega 1 over 2. There's your first constant acceleration, constant angular acceleration equation. And you already know how to use it. I'm not even going to give you a new sheet here or make you go get a new tattoo for rotational motion. You just swap out the symbols. It's that easy. Even a college freshman could do it. It's that easy. Second one. Uh, A equals delta V over delta T equals V2, oh no, not plus, equals V2 minus V1. That's delta V over delta T. In fact, that was just the definition of acceleration. That's all that one was. Um, and we swap the symbol. Alpha equals delta omega over delta T equals omega 2 minus omega 1 over delta T. There's a second constant acceleration equation. Couldn't be easier. Just swap the symbols out. All the ideas are exactly the same. Well, not exactly the same. The linear motion is a little different than the rotational. And things that rotate, rigid bodies that rotate have points that move in uh, linear, uh, not necessarily linear paths, but, but, uh, but those type of paths that we described there. Let's see, delta S equals one half A delta T squared plus VI delta T. That was the third one. So you write it in rotational form and you'll be able to determine, uh, you'll have your third constant angular acceleration equation just that easy. Let's see. Take out S, put in theta. Take out A, put in alpha, leave T alone. Take out V, put in omega, leave T alone. You got that? See, I don't even need to teach you anything new. This is, this is just a day of, of, let's do the same old stuff. And then the fourth constant acceleration equation. V2 squared equals V1 squared plus 2A delta S. And put it in rotational motion form, constant acceleration. Uh, so it's 
it's either constant A or constant alpha. Actually, it's both. Um, take out the V, put in omega. Take out A, put in alpha. Take out S, put in theta. There you go. That easy. That's why everybody took the optional the other day. They read ahead and said, hey, this is easy. I don't need to go in. I'm going to stay in bed. Chat. Three o'clock and they're still in bed. Amazing. Just amazing. All right. So let's uh, let's try some of this. Let's do a constant acceleration, a constant rotational acceleration problem. Now, be careful with it. Don't just jump right into it. Uh, a CD turns on, turns up to speed, goes from rest to 500 RPM. What's that stand for? Rotation, revolutions per minute is generally what it stands for. Revolution. So we're, we've got to be careful because that's not the usual, those are not the proper units for rotational motion in these equations. What did I say were the units of angles? Rads. Radians or rads, not revolutions or portions thereof. They're, of course, related because something that's going in a revolution is going through some radian angle thing, but we've got to make sure we've got the right, right deal to it. Does this in 5.5 seconds? Want to find the angular acceleration. We don't necessarily have to worry about direction because uh, we didn't say which direction was turning, whichever direction it's going to turn from rest to that, it's doing it in uh, the same direction. Remember how to do constant acceleration problems? What do you do? What do you need to do a constant acceleration problem? Remember? See, every constant acceleration problem will involve four of the five possible variables. Three of them you'll have. The fourth one you're to find. So what are the three variables we have? Just like our regular constant acceleration problems, just things are turning instead of moving. What are the, what are the three things we have? Time. Delta T equals 5.5 seconds. Initial velocity is, but this is initial angular velocity is zero. Starts from rest. What else do you have? Sort of. We have this, we have the, that's actually called the frequency. That's uh, uh, the uh, you know the engineering number we've used, but it's not going to work in these equations. So we've got to fix it. It's revolutions per minute. We need it to be per seconds because that's where our our basic time unit is. One minute on top, so it'll cancel the one minute on the bottom. How many seconds in a minute? All of them. 60. And then here's the next part. We've got revolutions on the top. We don't want revolutions. So we put revolutions on the bottom. How many radians per revolution? 2 pi. It's that easy. 2 pi radians per revolution. Now we have the final angular velocity. What is that? 52.4. 52.4 
radians per second. RAD per S. So there's the three things we are given in this constant acceleration problem. The one thing we're supposed to find is alpha. Which equation has those four things in it? That, that, the, uh, the average acceleration one has, no it doesn't, number two does. We're looking for alpha. We've got omega one and two, we've got the time. That's not the average acceleration. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you said uh, that's the only one that had average. Yeah, that, well, remember in constant acceleration problems, the average acceleration and the instantaneous acceleration are always the same because it never changes. When you have a number that doesn't change, its average doesn't change either. So we use equation number two, omega two, minus omega 1 over delta T, that's 52.4 minus 0 radians per second over 5.5 seconds. That's how hard this stuff is. That hard. What's that equal, Len? A little less than 10 seconds. I mean, yeah, a little bit less than 10. Uh, 9.5, what are the units? Radians per second squared. Radians per second squared. The speed is changing, 9.5 radians per second, per second. And plus means uh, the acceleration is in the same direction and it was turning because we took that to be a plus. Uh, we didn't talk about it, you know, it, it's sitting there turning, whatever direction it's turning in. The, the thing to it, whatever plane it's in, that's the same plane it always turns in in our class. Yes, We're not going to let these things wobble as they turn. So x, y, y. Yeah, well, I don't know, the CD in my office is that way. Yours might be that way. So it just, whatever plane it turns in, it stays in that plane. The brain in Spain is the main. Don't joy you. You didn't watch that movie? My Fair Lady? You're a horrible movie. <laughs> that's 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 what it took. How many? Uh, how long did it take me to get into constant acceleration problems at the start of the term? It took uh, two weeks or something, didn't it? We're there in one class, rotational motion, because you already have everything. Nothing changes drastically from what we had before. Uh, oh, time to go. We could very easily count now the number of revolutions because we could find out what the change in position was. And we'd know how many revolutions it went through. In fact, do that over the weekend. See if that helps keep you out of jail. Yep, Tyler getting that call to come bail you out, Joey. County Sheriff. Tired and... I mean, even though they take credit cards now.